Thanks for coming. Um, if you came to listen to accessibility and security, you are in the right room. Congratulations. <laughs> it's, um, it's quite good. Um, I'm Nick Steenhout. I uh, have been doing web accessibility since the mid-1990s. And uh, one of the things that really interests me is this concept that uh, a lot of people talk about accessibility and a lot of people talk about security. But the two topics are really discussed together. So this is a fairly introduction level talk about the two topics. Uh, if you're a security expert, don't expect me to dive really deep into security. This is not what it's about. Uh, neither is it a deep session about accessibility. It's really a, a session to start making us think about how the two interact together. I work at Simply Accessible, a uh, consulting firm uh, based in uh, Canada, but we also have um, um, people working in the States and in Australia and in England as well. So we're, we're pretty much uh, worldwide. We aim for worldwide domination. Before I go on, I'd like to see a show of hand if there's anyone that has a sight impairment that needs me to describe the slides as I go along. One person. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so the intro slide is a photo of a bunch of padlocks uh, together, and uh, you really can't tell which one is which and, and how you're going to get into that locked uh, area. Right, so, um, did you guys hear the story about the double arm amputee who wanted to go cash a check at the bank because his wife gave him a check and he went to his wife's bank account, uh, West Bank branch, and um, this uh, bank had a no exception policy that anyone who was cashing a check that did not have an account at that branch had to give a thumbprint. Right, the guy was born without arms, right? You see the problem here. The cashier said, well, sir, I, I recognize your problem. Obviously, you can't give us a thumbprint, but um, that's the policy. We have no exception. So it went round and round, and the solution the bank gave was, well, open an account with us. And uh, well, of course, in the process of opening the account, you need to give a thumbprint because it just goes round and round and round. So this is... Um, this is a, a good thing to start thinking about. You establish these good, solid policies about what you need to do for security, and it can have unintended consequences. So you have to be ready to look at your policies, modify your policies, or in some cases, um, provide exceptions to the policies. This slide is a uh, karate guy breaking a stack of bricks with his elbow. And um, we're talking about the idea that if it's easy to use, it doesn't necessarily have to say it's easy to break. Um, a lot of people in security says, well, we want to make sure it's hard to break and, and we'll increase the level of complexity, and that's fine. But you can make really secure applications that are actually easy to use. You have to put yourself in the position of the users rather than in your position of the, uh, the security expert. Uh, there really is no need for comp conflict, but there is a possibility that as you start building a more and more complex application, you're going to introduce vulnerabilities. So it's important to Take your time and, and check it out, but don't assume that to make an app secure, you have to make it difficult or tricky to use. This slide um, is really just a quote. It says, without reflection, we go blindly on our way, creating more unintended consequences and failing to achieve anything useful. That was Margaret Wheatley that said that. And this, this concept of reflection, of examining what we do, how we do, why we do it, is important. Because often we do things one way because 
everybody else does it that way, or because we've done it this way all along. Um, so we have to reflect a little bit about what we do, how we do it. We have to plan for the future, because when we start planning about all eventualities, we will avoid pitfalls. And as we build the project, we start reflecting. We planned for this, we made this assumption, and is it working? And I'm sure that's a process in your workflow that you're already doing, but start thinking about it in terms of accessibility as well. Here's another anecdote. Photo of the White House. Um, the White House uh, has a uh, petitions website, so people can create petitions on the White House uh, site. It's on uh, petition.gov.com, I think, something like that. Anyway, there was this petition a few years ago that um, was looking at copyright and DRM uh, material. Uh, and the idea was to legislate to allow media shifting so people with print disabilities could actually access material. So whether it's someone who's uh, blind, has low vision, or can't hold a book because they're paralyzed. So this petition was made, and on the White House website, they use a CAPTCHA system, which was not accessible by people who were blind. And they had an alternative, which was an audio CAPTCHA, which was so garbled that nobody could understand it. So that caused a few problems with people, the, the primary target of that petition, being able to sign the petition. So people decided, all right, well, we'll complain to the White House because uh, we want things to change. Wouldn't you know it, to be able to send an email complaint to the White House, you have to complete a CAPTCHA. So that didn't actually turn out well. In the end, there was not enough signature to make that petition go forward. This is a case where quite Obviously, security trumped accessibility. Next slide is a photo of a guide dog. And we're talking about conflicting needs. Um, it happens often that we want to make accommodations for people with disabilities. But which one is more important? Talking about real life accessibility rather than on the web. is giving access to someone who uses guide dog more important, or do we have to be careful of the person who has severe dog allergy in the workplace? Which, which accommodation becomes the most important? Um, as a wheelchair user, I love really flat surfaces. Polished concrete is excellent, but my friends that use canes and crutches say, the moment it's a bit wet, it's like an ice rink. So we prefer carpet. Which one is more important? You have to look at um, the conflicting needs and try to find the least, um, the least impactful uh, problem, the, the least impactful solution, so, sorry. And, and that does cause a dilemma. Uh, photo of white, uh, blue pill and a red pill, a little bit like in the matrix, you know? Which one are you gonna take? You have to think in terms of, of okay, what's fair, what's unfair, what's just, what's unjust. Um, you have to think about the fact that there's normally not one single solution that's going to work for everybody in all situations all the time. You have to look at coming up with creative solutions. Those of you who are coders, I'm throwing this as a challenge to you. You like a challenge. You like something that's tricky. It's going to be fun. So stop thinking in terms of accessibility, not so much in terms of Oh my God, I have to comply with all these guidelines and regulation and it's so difficult. No, think in terms of, hey, this is fun. This is something I haven't tried before and let's see how I can make it work. And if there's a solution that hasn't been found before and you come up with it, then hey, kudos to you because that's great. Now, why should we do accessibility? Um, I'm going to talk about legal requirements, photo of a um, judge's hammer. A gavel, I think, is the word in English. Sorry, I'm French-speaking originally, so if I speak weird words sometimes, that's, that's why. Uh, I could probably talk about the legal environment for 
a whole week. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to tell you, be aware there are legal requirements in your work. Uh, I make an assumption, perhaps foolish, that you're mostly based in, New in Australia and New Zealand. Um, be aware that in Australia was the largest, biggest, first huge lawsuit um, in terms of web accessibility. And can anyone remember what it was about? Show of hands. Yes. Yes, the Sydney Olympics 2000, um, where basically it was said that uh, people with disability couldn't buy tickets, couldn't find information about getting to the venue and all that, and a lawsuit was lodged and won. Uh, in terms of legal environment in uh, Australia, the largest, the, the most important aspect is the Australia Commonwealth Disability Discrimination Act 1992. And it basically says you can't discriminate against people with disabilities on the basis of their disabilities and therefore make your websites accessible. Of course, in 92, we weren't talking about websites, so there's been things that are um, extrapolated, but that's the basic idea. Next slide is a bunch of dollars on a stack, and we're talking about commercial incentives. Advocates for Accessibility like to say there's approximately 20% of people with disabilities in the world. And that, that's, uh, that's pretty much a constant worldwide. So one in five. We can't say that one in five person on the web has an accessibility need. We can't say that. But the thing is, we don't know because there's no metric to measure uh, this person is a screen reader user, this person uses drag and dictate, this person uses keyboard only. Hey, this person is on a mobile phone and may have accessibility requirements that are similar to people with disabilities. We just don't know. Um, thing is, it's not a numbers game. We want to be as accessible to as many people as possible because people with disabilities spend money on the web. Um, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about Pete, my mechanic. Back in the 90s when I was in Chicago, the guy was really, really great. Uh, he was honest, he was reliable, he was quick, and you knew he didn't mess up with you. But I couldn't get into his uh, garage. He had a six inch step at the entry of his office. And I put up with that for a little bit, and then one day in the summer it was really hot, maybe in 25, 30 degrees, really humid, and I stayed there for 20 minutes, even though I called ahead, mobile phone weren't around then, so I called ahead and they said, yeah, we'll open the door, we'll come and see you. I'm here melting, 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 and finally about 20 minutes later, somebody came in. A similar thing happened in winter. It was minus 20 this time, and my nose literally, f well, it didn't fall off, but I was left out in the cold for a while. And I spoke to Pete, and I said, Pete, you know, you could invest a couple hundred dollars in putting in a ramp, and that really would make a big difference. And he said, Nick, you're the only person with a disability that is my client. Why should I put in a ramp? So I looked at him and I say, take a minute, think about why do you think that is? And I saw the universe shift right in front of my eyes. He suddenly got it. A couple of weeks later, at the end of winter, he put in a ramp and I referred people to him and he had several new wheelchair users as customers. On the web, we can't see it quite that way, but that's part of why we want to do things. And finally, uh, this slide is uh, an adult holding a kid's hand. Um, why do we want to make things accessible? Because it's the right thing to do. Uh, we want to do the right thing, generally speaking. A corporation has, have more and more of a desire to, do, uh, to act ethically and responsibly, so that's part of the process. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about security and accessibility. Here's a photo of a cat peeking at a table, and um, I'm saying CAPTCHAs are evil. Who doesn't know what CAPTCHA stands for? We have a few hands. All right, I'm going to read it because it's a mouthful. Completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans. Right? CAPTCHAs. When uh, we speak about CAPTCHAs, normally we, we have this image of the recaptcha uh, image 
that we have to put in type in text that's garbled. Uh, that, that's one of many different types of captures, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of them. Um, I want to point out that in 2005, the W3C came out with a statement saying, in effect, that captures are useless because people who benefit from breaking captures are a step ahead of everybody else, and they are able to break these through several different methods, whether it's computer breaking or it's a bank of people in India manually solving your captures. There, there are several different things. Uh, from an accessibility perspective, what you want to do is avoid relying on user input to make that resolution. There's no single way to increase security. We want to avoid spam. Uh, that's good. One solution is not going to work in all instances. And you may want to use several different of the solutions I'm talking about, or be creative and bring up, come up with your own. Um, if you come up with your own, I'm going back to think of the consequences of what might happen if you implement something that's all new and shiny. User testing is really important. The purpose of using spam, uh, captures is to reduce spam, right? Everybody agrees with that? Or maybe some people say the purpose of captures is just to be annoying, but um, I'm not sure that's the thing. The first thing, yeah? What's that? Yeah, um, we can get into that discussion at the end of the, I just want to make sure I go through, uh, I have a bit of material. Um, I guess the first thing you can do is validate the content of what's submitted. You can check for spammy content, and if you find it, you can kick it off. That, that's the very basis of things you can do. Um, the other thing is you can do a honeypot. This slide is quite literally a photo of jars of honey. Um, now, the idea of a honeypot is you create a, um, you create a field that you're not actually going to show to the user. And spam bots generally tend to want to f put something in all the fields. So you, um, you create a field, you label it clearly. So in case somebody with a vision impairment actually gets to that field, they know that, you know, don't put anything in there. It's just to trap spam bots. Then you hide the field with CSS, which is usually uh, respected by, um, by screen readers and assistive technology. And then when the form is submitted, you just check, is there something that has been submitted in that form, in that field? And if there is, then you can kick it off as being uh, spam. That's you know, something fairly straightforward, fairly quick you can do in your, in your form that will be one layer of, of checking for spam. Next slide is two people dancing. Dancing the two-step, because you can do two-step verifications, right? Uh, the idea here is you don't submit the content immediately. Uh, you take the content of the form submission, you display it on a second page saying, these are the entries you put in, is this what you wanted to put in? And then the person can go forward and submit it. Uh, this stops. Again, a lot of spam bobs are not conceived for this two-step approach. Uh, this becomes really important when you're looking at banking applications or applications where uh, personally identifying data or, or money information is passed through. Uh, it actually allows you to meet one of the um, guidelines, um, uh, guidelines criteria. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the WCAG the web content accessibility guidelines in a little bit. Um, but that's two-step verification allows you to meet one of these things. Next slide is a um, chronometer, an old-style chronometer in somebody's hand. And we're talking about time limits. Typically, spam bots are going to have two behaviors. The first thing is they get to a form, they fill it out as fast as they can, and they submit it. Or 
they harvest a whole bunch of form, get ready to fill it up, and then submit in batches. That gives us an advantage. That gives us a good tool, because we can actually check the time the form was loaded, put that in our form data, and then check against when the form was submitted. Um, which means we can say, hey, if the form was submitted too fast or if the form was submitted too slow, we can kick it out as being spam. Uh, this is a bit of code, basically inserting the time the form was viewed when, uh, when the form is loaded using PHP. And when you post the form, you just check and make it a time difference. Now, in my slide, I've put in an hour, which is, generally speaking, a fairly good amount of time when you look at a fairly straightforward form submission, whether it's login form, whether it's a contact form. But keep in mind, the more complex your form is, the more time it's going to take a user to fill out, especially if you rely on a screen reader to parse the content, or if um, you're deaf and uh, English is not your first language, and you're more familiar with sign language than written language. So you, you have to think in terms of it might actually take more time than you uh, originally assume for people to, um, to complete your form. So an hour is good for a simple form. You may need to give it a little bit more time for, for other forms. Now, one of the things that have been um, done quite a bit in the last few years is, all right, well, we don't like those visual captures where nobody, let alone people with disabilities, can actually understand the, the squigglies over the letters. So we're going to start asking simple logic questions to help with going through that. Um, that's one way. It's not ideal. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, and I'll talk about a few cases as to why we, uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, one of the things is there's a limited number of questions you can ask, and, and spammers have been building banks of answers for these questions. So we're kind of wasting our time. But um, one question that I saw often, not, not recently, but up until about a couple of years ago, we saw that a lot. A lot. The question is, what color is the sky? Right? It's pretty straightforward, you think. Uh, here's a slide of a bit of blue sky and cloud. But um, is it sunset? What color is the sky? We have a bit of blue. We have really pink and orange sky uh, in clouds in the sky. We don't know. The thing is, we don't know what color is the sky. It's not a simple answer. and. It might be picky to say, well, someone might want to say, I'm filling out the form in the middle of the night. I'm looking outside. The sky is midnight blue. Or it's gray because it's pouring with rain. The fact is, some people actually are quite um, literal in the way they think due to their disabilities. Someone with um, a, a disability on the autism spectrum can be become quite literal. And if you say, what color is the sky, you don't know that you're going to get the right answer. Another question, is an elephant larger than shrew? Well, I, no. gut reaction is, yes, of course. But there's this thing called an elephant shrew. <laughs> Again, being very literal, but let's face it, there are some people who are literal. Um, then, of course, there's people who are really afraid of shrews and mice. What if you hit someone who has a phobia and suddenly they see that question and they go, oh, mouse, ah, and they leave? You don't know. So you have to be careful of the questions you ask. And it can have, I'm going back to this, unintended consequences. The other really um, popular thing to do is simple math puzzles. You know, one plus one equals question mark, and then you expect the person to write the answer in, in the box. Now, is the person going to write two using the number two, or are going to actually spell out the number 
TWO. You don't know. So if you use that, you have to take account for the two different options. Where this becomes a little bit less um, tempting is that there's three to six percent of the uh, population in the United States. I don't know the number in Australia, but three to six percent of people in the United States have dyscalculia, which is a condition very similar to dyslexia, except instead of not being able to parse num uh, letters, they're not able to parse numbers. So suddenly you've possibly excluded up to 6% of people that are going to uh, fill out your form using this uh, simple math puzzle. Now to the rescue came uh, Google a couple of years ago with their um, reinvented captures where it's just a checkbox and, and the photo here is a toy robot and says I am not a robot because that's what Google suggests. Before I talk a little bit more about um, the Google reinvent capture, I'm going to talk about the question that we find on several sites. It's a checkbox, similar in concept, and it says, are you human? All right? It's a fairly straightforward question. We're asking, are you human? And if the person says yes, then we know they're not spammers. In the realm of unintended consequences, one of the questions very often asked by people who uh, do torture for a living, torturing prisoners and others, is, are you human? They try to dehumanize people by repeatedly asking that. So now if you ask someone on a form, say on a government website that needs to uh, check your ID, and you have a torture survivor that came back from, from the Middle East, and you ask them, are you human? And suddenly you've just triggered a major case of PTSD. So you have to be aware of the consequences of what you're asking. So let's talk about Google Captcha. It came out a couple of years ago, and every accessibility specialist kind of went, oh, God, another Captcha. It's all going to be messed up. And we tested it up, and lo and behold, it actually wasn't all that bad. It was, um, it was working. You could um, activate the checkbox with a keyboard. You could get the information announced uh, if you were a screen reader user. So that was good. It, it showed promise. Of course, the analysis here is trying to determine whether or not um, you're a robot, a spam bot, or you're human. And there are people who navigate their computers using drag and dictate, which is not just about dictating text, but it's also about command and control, being able to control your computer by voice only. Well, if you do that, then in effect, you're using a robot to do your navigation for you, and Google Capture just doesn't like it. Every time you use that, it says, hey, you're a robot. And then they go to next step verification, which is fine. It's good to have two levels of verification. Problem is, at this point, the uh, second level of verification is a series of images, and you have to select one or two, and you can only do it with a mouse. You can't access that second level verification with keyboard only. Um, not necessarily directly uh, relevant to disability, but these photos, uh, one is, I think, uh, match the sandwiches, which images are sandwiches and whatnot, is very culture specific. So it might work in Western Hemisphere, but when you're starting looking at um, all your potential clients that are in Asia or in Africa or in South America, you may actually run into problems there. Um, the second level verification is accessible for people with uh, using screen reader because there is an audio version available, but that audio version is only accessible if you use a screen reader. So if you're a sighted keyboard user, let's not forget sighted keyboard only user because there's a lot of us out there, um, you don't even know that there's an option to use the audio capture and you can't match the images just with the keyboard so that is causing problem. All that to say, there's good and bad with this 
Google Captcha. It's 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 an okay solution. It m probably is a less evil solution than than others, but it's not ideal. And earlier I said if we can avoid using uh, user input in checking whether or not they're um, they're human, they're not robots, then that's the that's the way to go. Next, we're talking about time sessions. And I have a photo of three dynamite stick with a timer uh, on it. Um, for security purpose, we often time the session. We don't want a session to remain active when the user is inactive or goes away from the computer. Um, but timing session can be a problem because we have users that need more time to go through and understand the forms especially when you're thinking about complex forms, banking, buying an airline ticket, these kind of things. Um, the um, web accessibility guidelines are saying if you have a time session of 20 hours or more, then you don't have to worry about it. So think about that 20 hours. If you're using time session that are shorter than 20 minutes, you want to uh, offer the option to extend, turn it off, or just modify the timing. So turn off the timing. You can have a button on your form saying, uh, there's timing uh, required for this form, but uh, if you need more time, you can turn off the time altogether. That's fairly straightforward. You can adjust the timing. So this slide is a form, just a checkbox, radio buttons to, um, to select different timing. So you can notify the user, this page, we have timing on it, uh, especially when you go through buying airline tickets. That, that can be a problem. You know, you have two minutes for this section and two minutes for that section and three minutes for the other. So you can give people the option of adjusting the timing. Um, the guidelines suggest offering up to 10 times the amount of uh, time you would normally give. So it can take 10 times longer to fill it out. The next slide is a stretch Humvee because we're talking about extending the timing. Um, and that's a solution that is used more and more and it actually works well. Uh, 20, 30 seconds before the session is about to end, you pop up a message using modal, which you are going to make sure is accessible, capture the focus and all that, and you say to the user, session is about to end, do you want to extend timing? Person clicks on the button, not a div masquerading as a button, but an actual button, and then the session is extended. So it's giving people a simple way to extend that. Now we're talking about re-authentication, cat and dog smelling each other. Um, if for some reason the user has gone away from the form and comes back and is timed out, or the user decided that uh, they were not able to use their mobile to complete your form and had to go to the desktop version, uh, you want to be able to capture the data and represent it to the user. That normally requires uh, uh, some form of user login because you want to keep the data. Um, you don't want to do that, just keep the data in the air. Um, but you can capture the data, save it, encrypt it, and then when you have the user go back, you can, uh, you can have it there and they can finish completing the form. Next slide is about data validation. Uh, just a fair validator at a subway. I think it's in London. Um, when you validate your form, often you trigger validation uh, on the on-click event when the user clicks on the, um, on the submit form. Except that you code it for on-click and then you forget that users sometimes activate the button by uh, 
using the keyboard rather than a mouse. So you have to capture these events. You want to have uh, uh, use a, a belt and, s and suspenders kind of solution where you have both a, uh, an event handler, but you also have a, an actual URL in case the event handler doesn't happen. Uh, not all browser using, uh, not all browser that our user use support scripting. Uh, some people use uh, specific browsers or assistive technology. That means that scripting is not supported. That's less and less happening, less and less, but it still does happen. So I mentioned earlier WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guideline, and this is a very small uh, snapshot of WCAG, the four principle, the 12 uh, guidelines that go around that, and uh, there's nowhere near all the success criteria. WCAG is the standard uh, that most people refer to, and it's full of really good information. It gives um, how to meet the different criteria, it gives information, it gives script and code uh, samples and all that. Um, I love WCAG and I hate WCAG because too many people rely on the guidelines and say, well, I met the guidelines and therefore my solution is accessible. That's not true. You, you can meet the guidelines and not be accessible or you can be creative in your solution to create accessibility and not actually meet the technical guidelines per se, but you're still accessible. So it's a good reference, but it's not the be all and end all. And, and let's remember that accessibility is not a check, uh, checklist. You know, it's not just check, 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 I've done it. It's, it's an, a continuum. So we're thinking, about, um, we're thinking about what we do, how we do it, how does it work for our users, and what kind of unintended consequences are there in, in what we've done. Uh, resources, I've actually put in some, uh, some information on my website, uh, my personal site, incl.ca. Uh, if you do a search for security and accessibility, my talk and the slides are gonna show, and you'll have that information there. And that leaves us a few minutes for questions, if there are any. A um, couple of things. First of all, awesome talk. As Thank someone you. with disability, thank you very much. Um, when I was thinking of my question, I went to Google the definition of confirmation bias to make sure I was using it properly. Yep. And the site I was on on my phone had a masthead that would, as I zoomed in on the screen, would expand as well, making it very unusable. So I thought yep. that was actually quite funny. Um, my actual question, though, is I m you might have a bit of bias because it's you will work with businesses that are reaching out to have this happen, but in your experience, is the typical small, medium-style website replication, how open are they to taking accessibility into account? Like, is it a typical thing for companies to say it's just not worth it? Or um, I, I think the, uh, the major problem is not so much the people saying it's not worth it as much as small projects, small websites actually not being aware that they have um, a, a legal requirement, but that they have, it, it would be good for them to become accessible. Uh, once you, you're able to advocate to that and, and make a good business case, you know, like talking to my mechanic about putting in a ramp, like, um, showing the, the, how silly it is to have a petition that is targeted for people that require a screen reader and not able to use that. Once you start talking with them uh, and explain that it doesn't have to cost very much when you implement accessibility from the start, uh, you get to see more and more buy-in. I'd just like to say thank you for the talk. Um, one thing you said about the captures and uh, the person behind me reiterated that certain captures do have purpose as in, you know, one for Google Maps where they uh, get to see the doors better and people say, you know, what the number is. And there was another one that um, translates old books. It makes AI for books yep. smarter. How does that play into it? And 
Um, yeah, how does that play into it? Well, the problem with anything that's image based is that it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to make that uh, parsed by assistive technology, uh, specifically screen readers. So you have to find an alternative way to provide that information, which typically has been to provide an audio alternative. And the audio alternative typically, uh, in order to avoid being able to get the, the uh, speech to text recognition happening, it's very garbled. And then you have this problem that it's no more accessible. Uh, so whether you use uh, numbers that are distorted or photos of street addresses or translation of old books, those are all solutions that are um, sub suboptimal. And uh, just one more thing. If, has there been a case where you've put in um, a system to make something more accessible, but in doing so, made it less accessible for other, for other disabilities? You can build solutions that appear to be accessible on the surface and have uh, issues for other groups. Uh, one example that pops to mind is um, using a whole bunch of areas to, area to make uh, tabs accessible. And it works for screen reader users, but it doesn't work for sighted keyboard only users. So, there, there are different use cases that you have to, to look at to make sure that you hit all the points. Anybody else? Yeah, good day. Yeah. Um, one of your earlier screens talked about security versus accessibility. Um, I think there's always been a trade off, not even just in accessibility, but security versus convenience. Mm. Uh, is, do you got any examples you can cite of some place that has done a good job of this? Off the top of my head, I can't really list anything that, that is striking. I can tell you that a lot of sites are doing better and better, uh, but specifically one site that has done a stellar job at reducing that right now, I, I can't say that I have one that, that really strikes to mind. Um, a lot of sites are using captures or Google captures still as, as a, a method for, for stopping spam. and. Yeah. Where do you see the intersection of uh, good user experience in design and accessibility? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Where, where do you see good user experience in design and good accessibility crossing over? A lot of people seem to think that um, when you when you build a good UI, it will automatically be accessible. And um, a lot of the time that's right, but often it's not necessarily correct. I think that we, we want to see designers, UI designers and graphic designer work with, uh, with specialists in accessibilities more and work with, um, with users with disabilities to, to get a better understanding. I, I think we're starting to, to hear more of a talk about this concept that uh, user experience, usability, and accessibility should really work together. We are, we're seeing that more, but it's not a given that because something is usable, it's necessarily going to be accessible. Thanks, Nick, for your talk. Uh, I'm in the identity management and authentication space. Just wondering if you could comment on the accessibility of different authentication methods, for example, passwords versus certificates versus passwords with two-factor authentication and an external token or your Google Authenticator on your phone? What works well there? What's not so good? I, I, actually, I can't answer that because it completely depends on the implementation that you've been using. Uh, you can have a, an implementation of just password that is done in such a way that the screen reader user is not going to be able to type it in, not gonna, they're not going to know that it's a password field. You can have an implementation where you're using a password and a, a two-step 
authentication that actually works brilliantly because the fields are, um, are fully labeled properly and it's a visible focus and the second layer of authentication actually works as well with keyboard. So I, I can't tell you which combination works best. It all depends on the implementation of those methods. physical tokens. I, I, I'm afraid I can't comment on that. I've not really seen it a whole lot in, in the real world. I haven't, um, I haven't had experience with doing user testing with that. So I, I'm not in position, but I'd be happy if you contact me after the fact. I'll do a bit of research for you if you want, and uh, we can talk about that. Hey, um, sorry for interrupting before. Um, good talk. I just wanted to ask, so um, I heard a statistic a while ago that a lot of websites uh, and companies, sorry, spend a lot of money trying to get Internet Explorer 6 working <laughs> for their website, but the share, market share of that is smaller than the accessibility market share. Yeah. So a lot of companies would be better off targeting. They get more bang for their buck, but yep. also, obviously, um, it's a very altruistic thing to do. Um, do you know of any tools or... Uh, chains that developers can put into their, to like their builds to check if a website is accessible or if the website they're building is accessible? Um, there's a, there are a lot of tools available out there. I can't tell you how many. I can't tell you which one's the best because there, there's, you know, there's new tools coming out each, each month just about that does uh, automated testing. Uh, depending on the level of testing you want to do, uh, you can use something like Tenon.io that is great for large-scale automated testing of your sites. Uh, or you can just run things through the WebAIM Wave toolbar if you're doing one page at a time. Um, the thing to remember, though, is that there's only so much automated testing can tell you. And you can end up with uh, false negatives. Uh, you can end up with uh, actual barriers missed. And then there's a whole range of things that require manual testing. So um, automated testing is a good start. It's a good indicator of health, but it's not a, a specific diagnostic tool. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I guess my question it was somewhat related to that, but for your smaller projects who aren't the size of Google and some of these large sites yep. that just don't have the budget for that and they're always going to exist, rather than the after the fact testing, is there a bunch of resources like the Google captures or similar that have been preferred or listed or something that a smaller project could use to ensure that accessibility to a certain extent? I'm going to throw it out there to you that if you code to standard, you've met 80, 85% of accessibility needs out there. That, you know, just code to standard. Don't reinvent uh, form elements because oh, I can't actually style this radio input, so I'm going to create my own. Don't. Um, don't use divs as buttons and that kind of things, and, and you will have met the vast majority of, of accessibility needs. Uh, are there libraries out there of uh, accessible solution? Um, there are several, depending on, on what you're using. Uh, I know that there's accessibility uh, tools in Bootstrap and jQuery, and, and there's libraries out there. So depending on, on what project uh, you use, it's out there. You might have to do a little bit of digging to, to find it. The other thing is, uh, if you're on Twitter, use the hashtag A11Y, send out a question, and there's a whole bunch of people that specialize in that, and they can really give you a hand with your question. Thank you so much, Nick. That talk was amazing, and it definitely profoundly affected how I'm going to be doing things, if not everyone here, on behalf of LCA. I'd like to present you with this small gift. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Nick. <laughs>